Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome back to our Meet the Author series. And uh, I'm, I'm so happy, uh, as you will see, a big smile on my face, to uh, welcome Jason Farman, who's a uh, professor at the University of Maryland uh, and also director of the Design, Cultures, and Creativity program there. Um, and he's the author, and that's the reason of his visit, of a absolutely amazing book that I cannot recommend highly enough. Um, the book title is Delayed, The Art of Waiting from the Ancient to the Instant World, um, Delayed Response. Um, my friends actually are already annoyed because I, uh, I talked so much about this book among friends, and uh, I also shared a bunch of copies. So. I need some royalties yes. from you, I guess, <laughs> um, as a gift. It's such a pleasure to, to have you here. Um, and uh, when I read this book um, uh, late last year, I was reflecting on all the books I've read in 2018. And I have to say, this is the book that had the deepest impact on my thinking uh, last year. Um, so um, thank you for that and congratulations. Thank you. So this book, for those of you who haven't read it, I recommend it. There are copies out there to buy. Is a book that uh, is some sort of counterintuitive. We all uh, live in a time of real-time communication, of instant communication, and um, just looking at my own behavior, uh, if I have to wait somewhere, let's say I want to cross Mass Ave and uh, red is, is light, I would immediately pick up my phone and try to you know, check emails or do something because uh, the waiting feels like a waste of time. And yet, here is Jason and this book, um, uh, a complete eye-opener uh, to, to take a different alternative look at waiting, at the thing in between, uh, in between messages, but also in between action. And so we will we'll talk more about this idea that waiting actually uh, becomes meaningful, is, is, is a message in itself that we generate um, and attribute uh, meaning to, uh, how it is shaped by context and cultures, but of course also by technology, importantly. Uh, and, uh, but to start with, I was just wondering, how did you become interested in waiting, mm -hmm. something that most people try to avoid, get annoyed uh, by, yes. <laughs> or otherwise yeah. try to hack? How, how, how did it come about? Yeah, so most of my scholarship prior to this was in mobile technologies. My first book was about mobile media. And when I first started as a professor teaching undergraduate students, I began to notice that even with their standard feature phones, they were sending up to a couple of hundred text messages each day, um, which to me was really this mind-blowing choice. And I would talk to them, why don't you just simply pick up the phone and call the person you're trying to get in touch with? Why do you send so many text messages uh, in a given day? This is about um, 13 years ago or so. Uh, and the thing that stood out to me was the power of the message in our lives and the choice to engage a medium that made us wait. It really fit with contemporary society at the time and in our own moment as well, where a phone call that you place to someone, especially over a mobile device, is no longer calling to a place, it's calling to a person. And when you're calling to that person, you don't know what their context is. Uh, you might be interrupting some important meeting they're in, uh, or they might be lecturing in a class, or you don't really know what the context is. So mobile messages allow us to connect with people throughout the day, and they can respond when they get a chance. But the end result is that it makes us wait. Um, messages, the choice of messages, is uh, the choice of a medium that inserts waiting into our social lives. And it has been predominantly that way since uh, 2009, 2007 in the US and 2009 globally, where we're using our mobile devices more for messages and data exchange than we are for voice communication. Uh, so this is uh, the insertion of wait times into our lives. Uh, so this began sort of this fascination with asynchronous communication rather than synchronous communication, the power of that, and then the ultimate impact of those wait times on our lives. Uh, how The question really for me began with how do these wait times shape who we are as social beings? If we're choosing a medium that makes us wait, 
how does that shape our intimate lives? How does that shape our social interactions with people and who we are? And then how do we occupy those times? If all of a sudden here we are in our contemporary moment spending much of the day waiting for the people we're closest with to respond to us, what do we do with those times? And how do we imagine uh, the use of wait times or even imagine it as potentially wasted time and, and maybe how to recuperate that, how to think differently about wait times when they become such a dominant uh, experience for us in our instant age. And we will drill deeper on, yeah. on all of these topics, of course. Um, to start with, uh, maybe, uh, as you suggested, and you started with like the, the cell phone, instant culture, texting uh, uh, generation. Um, but in the book, you, you actually take the reader on a journey. Um, yeah. You go back uh, all the way to the first set of mobile technologies, which were messaging sticks used by Australian Aborigines. Uh, you walk us through uh, letters and the different response times um, during the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. You, you um, cover all sorts of technologies, but also cultural context. You yeah. traveled to Japan, you, yeah. you went to Paris, but also uh, traveled across the US. And as you were some sort of exploring different technologies and cultural contexts and context of, of, of waiting, mm -hmm. um, what's that, what are some of the lessons learned from that journey? What, what, what stood out to you yeah. as of you know, both some sort of the evolution nature of waiting yeah. and, uh, and how it interacts with people? Yeah, uh, the, the follow-up to even the first answer ties in with this, uh, where the book process began, researching uh, this book. It, it was actually here in Cambridge uh, when I was interacting with a, um, a scholar at MIT who studies Japanese popular culture. And he made an offhand remark um, to me about an emerging practice among teens in the country. He, he said, the, the thing that's happening now is that teens in romantic relationships especially are sending each other blank text messages. So the idea is that if you're in a, a relationship with someone, uh, you send them just a blank text, no words, no messages or videos or anything along those lines. You just send them a blank message. And their response as your partner was to respond with another blank text message with as little time elapsed as possible. Reminds me of my balls, by the way. Yes, <laughs> right. So, just kidding. <laughs> so uh, the, the wait time here is actually the content of the message. And that's one of the things that uh, echoes throughout the book and across all of these examples is that wait times are not an in-between time. They are content in and of themselves. We give them meaning. They're moments of interpretation. Uh, so the messages between these teens. And then uh, another example is um, throughout the world, and I focus specifically on Italy, where people in the late 1990s and early 2000s would ring each other, uh, where you would just ring and hang up your phone, and your caller ID would pop up on the person's phone, and then that person was then supposed to ring you back with as little time left as possible, something that happened throughout the world, these, these rings or beeps or flash messages. And it's the thing that these represent is that wait times are meaningful, uh, that we give them meaning, we interpret these, these times. And, for me, I came at this project thinking about waiting as an in-between time, something between moments, something between messages, something between the content that we're exchanging. And I walked away realizing that wait times are meaningful in and of themselves. They are content in and of themselves. Silence is content. We, we fill it with meaning. Um, so from the very first messages humans ever exchanged it with the Aboriginal message sticks, um, which were exchanged as far back as 40 to 55,000 years ago as humans began to migrate onto the continent of Australia. They used these communication technologies as a means of sharing information, but also as establishing uh, a temporal rhythm to life that's uh, based on the journey across the land. How long does it take to get between places? And how long do messages take? Is a way of connecting the human body with its time as it moves and as it delivers message as messages. Uh, are exchanged uh, all the way up until our contemporary moment. We're constantly filling these gaps with meaning. So they're, they're not really gaps. They're, they're moments of analysis for me. They're moments to understand our personal lives, our intimate lives, our social lives, how we build knowledge and exchange knowledge. Uh, wait times are not in between. They're actually content in and of themselves. Uh, so that, I think, resonates across all of these technologies and eras. Um, 
And there are a lot of other things that fit with that as well. Thinking about the value we give time uh, and the synchronicity that we develop with people in different eras. Technologies synchronize us with people, especially as we're exchanging messages across geographic distances. Uh, we build in temporalities of connection depending on how our media connect us and the paces of those media shape the human experience of time in a given era. And we, we uh, wrap ourselves around those times in a sense uh, where uh, the expectations of social life are, they fit with the technologies of an era uh, and are shaped by that. Um, and we realize within that context, you know, what it means to wait and the delays that kind of emerge based on our expectations and, and how we respond to those is really similar across eras and cultures as well. Sort of the disdain of waiting in, in particular moments uh, as we are wondering when the message will arrive, when when will I be able to hear from this person? Uh, in my archival work, that's something emerged that emerged over and over again, people wondering what's happening on the other side of that communication gap and filling that gap with meaning um, and setting their, their synchronization and temporality ar ar around the ways that media connect people. Uh, so how we use media, how they shape the human experience of time, and then how we respond to that, I think, is something that is interesting to study across eras. It's intriguing, as you describe it, that there is some universality to it across mm. cultures. But at the same time, as you describe in the book, but as you also mentioned, um, what value or what meaning we attribute to, to waiting is highly contextual. I would like to stick a little bit yeah. uh, with, with the uh, situation where we're where, waiting may not be appreciated. Um, many situations come to mind, right? Um, uh, one of the stories you tell in the book is actually when you have to upgrade your operating system or download something and it takes forever, um, or if you have to wait uh, for an elevator. Uh, yeah. And can you share with us a little bit what some sort of cultural techniques and societal techniques have evolved around making us be willing to wait longer yeah. maybe, or some sort of to cope with the waiting itself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And in computing culture especially, it's fascinating to see how wait times are handled on the design side of things and imagining how designers are confronting wait times. We have to confront wait times. We will always be waiting uh, in, in some fashion or another with our technologies. In the early days of computing, with uh, the Xerox Star being one of the first uh, computers that was networked and it also provided a graphical user interface so people could connect with each other, exchange files. And how do you communicate with your user that something's happening behind the scenes? So this is something that actually resonates across life and the design of everyday life. We are waiting and there's complexity behind the waiting uh, that we're not always privy to. You're waiting at a red light. Uh, but you don't necessarily know how your wait time fits in with the larger structure of how a city functions. Uh, similarly with networked computers, the files, how they're exchanged, how that computer interacts with that file, it, these are complex systems that designers have to put us at ease about. Uh, and so you have wait cursors emerge. Uh, with the Xerox Star, it was the hourglass. Uh, and then you eventually have Susan Kerr, the graphic designer, designing for Macintosh uh, the wristwatch weight cursor, and what's fascinating is that these things that, uh, that lead up to our own buffering icons on our browsers get us to stick around about three times as long as a system that doesn't give us any kind of feedback. So we need some kind of feedback to interact with, uh, which does uh, connect to the story of the elevators as well. Uh, Post-World War II in New York City, as skyscrapers began to go up in mass around the city, there were so many complaints about these wait times. We're, we're having to sit down here in this lobby waiting for the elevators is too long. There was one building where people complained to the building's manager about it, and he brought in some engineers to say, please solve this problem. These people are waiting too long. And they came back to him and said, it's an unsolvable problem. We just can't make things go faster. It's a, it's, uh, complex, people are stopping at different floors, there's no way to, to speed this system up. There was a psychologist in the building who said, who got permission from the building's manager for a bit of an experiment, and with his permission, 
the psychologists had mirrors put up all around the lobby. So people, while they waited for the elevator, could look at themselves and look at the other people waiting, and the complaints disappeared completely. <laughs> and some people actually applauded the building's manager for solving the problem. Uh, so as we wait uh, to give some kind of feedback, something to look at, something to occupy our attention, gets us to be a bit more patient, uh, about three times as long uh, as systems where we, are, we don't know what to do with our attention. We don't know where to pull our attention. And cognitively, it's very interesting to think about how our brain adapts to these wait times that are introduced with different technologies. A colleague of mine at the University of Maryland, Ben Schneiderman, has done some studies on the, the cognitive experience of waiting for these uh, technologies. And if there's nothing that pulls our attention back in, nothing to stare at a buffering icon or to look at myself in the mirror, our brains move on pretty quickly at about the two second mark. Uh, we're, we're off to something else unless something calls us uh, back in. So designers realize this, that if you're waiting for that content to load on your browser, you're gonna be gone. Uh, five seconds later, uh, about 20% of your users are, are gone. And that, that number just continues to change as, as bandwidth speeds change as well. Um, so what are the designs that are gonna keep your customers around? Uh, so waiting for me is that really interesting contradiction for the computing industry and business writ large where uh, waiting is a thing that's a bug in the system that needs to be eliminated. It's gonna drive your customers away, but then also waiting is that opportune moment to seize on your attention while you're waiting to cross the street uh, or waiting at the red light or waiting for this event to start. How do you occupy your time? Uh, it's a great opportunity for people to pull your attention toward their products. Uh, so the contradiction in that is really interesting and how designers deal with it uh, was really fascinating to study. That's a perfect segue from some sort of strategies of avoidance or coping towards uh, the benefits of waiting and, and some sort of changing our own mindset as, as we look and, at in these between times and how we create meaning out of it. Um, you have a whole series of examples and stories um, uh, in the book where you, where you demonstrate how waiting has some sort of a, 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 a a constitutive role to play for knowledge creation, for learning, mm -hmm. but also for empathy. Yeah. So it has a very uh, productive function uh, if, if looked at it the other way yeah. around as opposed to yes. it's just a waste or, or an annoyance. Uh, I was wondering, could you share a few of these stories and maybe yeah. it's the NASA example or right. others? That yeah. yeah, and for me those two points are really key toward recuperating wait times as beneficial rather than our um, predisposition toward waiting as something that's wasting our time. Uh, especially when we're so, there's so much time poverty we feel, you know, I, I don't have very much time to offer you. Uh, so when, you're, when I'm waiting or someone is wasting my time, uh, we feel that we're losing that valuable uh, resource. And I noticed this uh, in, I'll begin with one anecdote that's at the very end of the book of me waiting in line at the grocery store. For me, waiting has become this analytic uh, where I kind of am trying to understand society in those moments of waiting, uh, where I uh, can, can study things a bit, bit more. I was in my hometown in Maryland uh, at the grocery store on a Saturday morning, and there was a woman who was checking out in front of me and she was paying half with cash and half with food stamps and she had a toddler in the cart and she had a bunch of coupons and they had called the manager over to kind of make sure all of these deals were being met and uh, she went through kind of each item to make sure that she was spending her money while that, you know, there was a deal that didn't come up and it had to be scanned. There was an affluent woman in front of me who turns around and looks at me and just like rolls her eyes like, can you believe this woman? And then things kind of continue and uh, she's, continuing to use her time on a very busy morning, and there are two men behind me who verbalize their discontent with uh, this situation that this woman's wasting her time. And for me, these wait times can potentially be a moment of us building radical empathy for others' circumstances, where waiting can be an investment in the social fabric of how time is unevenly distributed to people. That, to me, was 
something I learned in the process of the book. Uh, there's a meme that has been going around uh, with a picture of Beyonce and s says something along the lines of, remember, you have the same 24 hours as Beyonce does. Uh, kind of like, how are you spending your time while Beyonce is using those same 24 hours to be wildly successful? Um, and by the end of working on this book, I realized how untrue that is, that people don't have the same access to time. Uh, they are asked to use their time in very distinct and different ways than I am, uh, whether that be working two jobs and having to take public transportation between those jobs uh, and having to devote their having to wait in different ways, being asked to wait in different ways. And if in our own wait times we can imagine investing those wait times into the social fabric, um, and I, I think that has the potential to build some radical empathy. And, and that to me is, is, has been one of the personal ways that I've taken this annoying time and tried to recuperate it uh, and to encourage others to think about wait times as investments in the social fabric and, and trying to find ways of, of identifying injustice and power structures looking at Puerto Rico being without power, uh, being waiting for, for power, how wait times are opportunities to identify power structures within a society, how people are then asked to wait in different ways is one way that I, I find waiting to be deeply beneficial in my own life. Um, and knowledge exchange is another one which I think we can get into. Um, but I think focusing on the empathy is, is a big factor for me anyway. And uh, since you were describing this situation and, and also uh, in the grocery store and, and already alluding to some sort of the relation between power and time um, and also the social justice aspects of, of, of you know, the work and theory you're developing here, perhaps you can spend uh, some more time on, on this topic, which I know is close to, to our hearts, uh, particularly here and in 2019. And what was really interesting to me in the book is uh, the way you you basically complexify the the, the the power implications of time that it it looks almost as some sort of a paradoxical situation that on the one hand um, you have some sort of check-ins fast check-ins for frequent flyers yeah. right where where that that clearly signal well my time is more valuable than than yours who has to queue you know over there, um, which is some sort of an expression of status and privilege yeah. and, and some sort of the currency of the time unit, mm -hmm. as you made the example before, uh, that, that my time is just you know, right. something different from your time, economically speaking mm -hmm. even. But then you also um, uh, told the story or kind of introduced the theme that there is now a new, a new trend where um, we slow down, mm -hmm. uh, and the we being, you know, privileged people who yeah. can afford to slow down and uh, to take offline time yeah. and things like that. Yeah. And so suddenly you start to understand, as I was reading this book, or look at, at it in different ways, what, what my own some sort of signaling is about my time. So for instance, um, I start to realize um, if I show up late to a meeting, that may be unintentional because you know I'm running from across the campus, let's say, but there is also a signaling effect if, if you know, whoever the boss is in a given yeah. situation in terms of seniority or hierarchy shows up late and everyone is waiting for yep. you, that this is some sort of signaling again that, yeah, you can wait for me because yeah. you know, my time is more valuable. And so I was yeah. wondering whether you could expand a little bit yeah. on these themes and maybe also this paradox that that time becomes a privilege and you know whatever we do signals yeah. already something. Yeah. I was just talking to a, a professor who taught in Italy and he said, in my own practice and also my mentor's practice, you as a professor never walk into the room first. Uh, it's, it's, it doesn't signal correctly to the students. You let people wait for you. Uh, and that's what I would do. I would, I would make my students wait for me as a reiteration of my uh, position within this uh, power structure between student and professor. And I found that really fascinating. And, and you see in these moments where we are waiting for other people 
how power is communicated, uh, how it's uh, exercised by making others wait. And I think that's also true in our intimate lives as well. As you are in a particular relationship, uh, whether it be a romantic relationship or a friendship, the one who makes the other person wait is, is uh, signaling a, um, a priority of time in that, in that relationship and creating a power asymmetry over who gets to wait and, and who, or who has to wait and who forces others to wait. Um, and at the same time, yeah, there is this interesting contradiction with these uh, movements that are asking us to, to pause, to slow down, uh, and asking us to be more deliberate with our time, uh, whether it be slow food movement. There's, there's a movement within the academy for slow, slow research, which is a, res a resistance. Sign me up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, the, the idea being that in the academy, especially with the tenure track, there are expectations about publishing and about the pace of life and that people are trying to resist, uh, that produce certain kinds of knowledges uh, and, and uh, don't feed into other forms of knowledge production. Uh, so people are trying to slow down. But you know, if you're an assistant professor in the room, can you slow down? You know, uh, that is very unlikely. Uh, within the structure as it exists, slowing down as an assistant professor who's on the tenure track is not really an option. Uh, you have to use your time in very specific ways. And that's what the, the book asks ultimately, is who is allowed to slow down? Uh, who are those people whose time is able to pause and to, to reflect uh, in ways that others are unable to because of the pace of life? So in my moments of busyness as well, uh, which I think since the book has come out has have been extreme, you know, busyness has been Extraordinary, which is this very odd experience for me as someone who's writing about the appreciation of waiting and taking these moments of waiting. I haven't really been able to slow down uh, very much. Uh, but in reflecting on my own busyness, trying to ask uh, who benefits from that experience of busyness? Uh, why do I feel so busy? And, and how does it feed into particular structures that uh, ask us to use our time in specific ways, and particular relationships uh, between people who are asking me to use my time in very particular ways. There's a fantastic book from a communication scholar, Sarah Sharma, called In the Meantime, where she studies the labor kind of behind the scenes, whether that be the taxi driver or the person who's cleaning up the plates from the slow food movement, you know, where you have affluent people kind of gathering around and pausing and, th and being very deliberate with their food. Um, who are the people behind the scenes who are cleaning up the plates for that event? Uh, are they able to pause and slow down in the same kind of way? Uh, so again, I think that time is distributed unevenly, and we're asked to use that time in very particular ways that, that both feed into the power structures and relationships and also ask us to, uh, uh, you know, and within the academy anyway, produce knowledge in, in specific ways as well. Um, so synchronization, again, is a, is a theme that emerges. Who are we synchronized with? How are we asked to synchronize our time? Whether that be with a technology that synchronizes us all in this room or within relationships that ask us to synchronize our time within those structures, uh, I think, are, are compelling questions. OK, taking that to heart, I think the waiting is over for our audience here. I would like to open it up for, for uh, questions and comments and, the, on, and reflections. Um, you, you can tell this um, gets very philosophical and very deep quite quickly, which makes it so exciting. Uh, but of course, it has also um, a uh, deep technology narrative and many other faces. So, um, wherever you would like to start. And please introduce yourself. I should also say that we are recording the session and we'll later pop, um, put it online, so. Hi, my name is Ron. I wanted to ask if you talked in your book about waiting as a social activity, mm -hmm. meaning things like waiting in line yeah. for a ticket that's not gonna be available until a particular time, so, so a big queue forms, or waiting for a, I don't know if people do this anymore, waiting for a CD to be released, probably yes, not. Yeah. Right. Uh, <laughs> but that, that kind of thing where people deliberately yeah. get into long lines and it becomes a social event to yeah. be waiting in this line. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Anticipation is something that emerges a lot in the book, and it, uh, whether you think about the launch of the next Apple device, Apple taps into this so precisely. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, 
the anticipation of the launch of something is very much about how we produce our relationship with it. So the leaks of the, the next Apple device and then eventually the launch, you know, the Apple event, this thing will be coming out in these months and then the waiting in line, the camping out overnight, the wait itself becomes an event that links us uh, to that product and, and signals our identities as particular kinds of consumers. Uh, so that romantic ethic around this product that I'm going to get is going to fulfill me in these particular kinds of ways. Um, and the wait times are a way of building that relationship with it. Um, and I link that actually in interesting kinds of ways with uh, Roland Barthes has a, has a book called the Lover's, A Lover's Discourse where he talks about waiting as uh, kind of an erotic experience uh, as we're waiting for the people we love. That act of waiting uh, builds desire for the people that we long for, but also for the products that we long for. Um, if you've ever been to sort of a massive concert as well, it's also a really good example of this where the you're waiting, you show up early, everyone's kind of mingling around, and then the lights drop. And then people begin to get excited and anticipate, and then somebody walks on stage. All of the, those moments of waiting where it builds anticipation, then you hear a note, you know? All of that is about wait times as building desire and connection. Um, and the way that I personalize this as well is to say, in those moments of waiting and anticipation, what do I hope comes on the other side of my waiting? What will arrive? What do I hope will arrive? And I use this as an analytic for my own life uh, to understand my desires a bit better. Uh, what do I hope comes on the other side of my waiting? What do I hope will be fulfilled? How will it satiate some of those needs in my life? And to understand how those desires shape who I am and who I think I am and also help kind of steer me in particular kinds of directions. I think we are very much steered in directions by these kinds of uh, anticipatory moments and, and connections and longings for things. So yeah, absolutely, that's a great question. Since we are here at Harvard Law School, yeah. uh, one of the, also as you mentioned before, um, how open we are some sort of to be notched into different directions, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, time notches uh, seem to play, play into right. this quite a bit, as, as you described. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Yes, please. Uh, so I was reading something yesterday uh, uh, that said, if you really want to know how a person is at their worst, put them in front of a really slow computer. Yes. Um, I was wondering if you uh, did any research or, or wrote anything yeah. in your book about like the type of person who is like more predicated to be patient hmm. in, a, in a situation right. where they, they feel like they, they shouldn't have to be waiting. Right, yeah, yeah. Probably the person who has very little experience with the system, uh, so doesn't already establish norms for that. Uh, there's a lot of research in the field of human-computer interaction, or HCI, around user, fr user frustration. And it usually centers around expectations and how those expectations aren't met. So I, I talked with an early uh, interaction designer um, who popularized the percent done progress bar, or the little bar that shows you how much is loaded, as opposed to just the opaque spinning buffering icon. And he was talking to me about this Xerox Star computer that first kind of gave that feedback that things are loading with this hourglass. And he said, overwhelmingly, people felt it was slow. Uh, and it actually did things faster than we'd ever done it before. It allowed us to connect and to do work at a pace that was unprecedented, but we overwhelmingly had the human experience of frustration with it uh, because in part that we set expectations for it and then when those expectations weren't met based on sort of network volatility and, and sort of the shifts of, of how the internet fluctuates, then we get frustrated uh, with it. So across the board, and this I saw uh, throughout history, which is so interesting to me. I imagined that the human experience of time as it gets compressed in the digital age and in this mobile age where we have technologies on us at all times, that we would be less patient. Uh, that time would be so compressed in our moment uh, that we would have a radically different experience of time and duration and delay. But you see this across all accounts of media throughout history, that as people have to wait in a, at a pace that was uh, not matching their expectation, they're frustrated. Uh, they're writing about their hostility toward the wait times, that the ship took too long to arrive. You know, it should have arrived here. Instead, it's quarantined in harbor, and I'm not getting my mail. Uh, so we, as humans, 
set expectations very early on, and when those expectations aren't met, that's when user frustration emerges. So uh, one of the students in my graduate seminar right now interviewed her grandparents who adopted the internet very early on um, and became early users, and they are very impatient, uh, which humors her. She's like, you guys, what else do you have to do? You know, <laughs> Why are you, you're, you're retired, you're sitting at home. It's, it's a couple of seconds, wait for the video to load. Um, but they get very frustrated with, with uh, slow download speeds. And um, you know, so for, for her, you know, interviewing them, she's, she noticed that trend of here are early adopters, kind of regardless of age or demographic, they set, they're setting their expectations. And when those aren't met, uh, user frustration emerges. Uh, yeah, so it was fascinating kind of tracking that across history as well. There is also a great story in the book where you basically bring an argument where the expectations are the other way around, that it should oh, right, take yes. longer to be credible. Yeah. And I think the example is price comparison sites. Yep. Yeah. You want yeah, to and share that story this too? first emerged for me with Facebook uh, in 2016. They launched a security scan of your profile to kind of let you know the vulnerabilities of your profile. You know, who can see what, uh, what sort of permissions you're giving to other outside websites and apps. And what happened was it was very lean code. It did its job very, very quickly. So it, you would have it scan your profile. It would spit back the results instantly. And Facebook noticed that people weren't changing any of their settings. And they said, why aren't they changing their settings? They, we've just told them that there's a vulnerability here in your profile. You've got all of these apps using your Facebook site, and you're not changing anything. And they realized that people didn't trust it. Uh, so what they did is they took the code, it did the scan, but then they told the code to build in a delay. So pause. Just wait a second. OK, now give the results to the users. And people overwhelmingly began to change the results because they thought it was thorough. Uh, so we have this certain cultural notion of thoroughness. The technology is faster than that. But culturally, the, the people designing it had to go in and build latency so that we trust it. And this is true Yeah, when you're on different websites finding the best deals. Uh, we expect a certain level of thoroughness. Uh, and it, it, very, very slight, we're talking very small time scales, but it's enough for us on a sort of uh, embodied level to, to build in trust based on those delays. Yeah. It's completely fascinating. Yeah. Whenever I think of uh, waiting in the extreme, I think of checkpoints, uh, waiting in check at checkpoints, waiting for occupations to be over and so forth. Yes, so yeah. I'm wondering how far you can take this notion of uh, connecting your brief uh, wait periods right. uh, in the advanced societies uh, in an international dimension, or whether yeah, it even applies. Right. Uh, you seem to have a very active imagination, which is very yeah. good, but I don't know how, how ordinary people uh, can relate to that. And hopefully they can, but maybe right. you can uh, go into that. Yeah, I think I was on a panel. Uh, there was a conference on social life of time, uh, and it was really interesting pairing. I was talking about buffering icons, uh, and my fellow panelists were talking about uh, South African apartheid uh, and and wait times. You know what was parallel in those things was talking about how time is exercised as power uh, and how we are ultimately imagining something coming on the other side of our waiting. What comes on the other side of waiting is where the imagination does it work. It's work for thinking about different futures. Uh, so it's both about identifying issues of power, who is controlling my time, who is asking me to wait, who is forcing me to wait, but also how can I imagine a different future? Uh, wait times are essential toward thinking of futures that don't yet exist. Uh, the, the, cognitively, we're, we have what's called the, the default network of the brain, uh, often called the imagination network, that only kicks in when you're waiting and when you're daydreaming. And the, the, cre the imagination network requires pauses to imagine this, things that couldn't have been accessed if you searched for them. Wait times, for me, are the possibility of thinking about these two things side by side. Who is controlling my time? Who is in power of my time? And how can I imagine a different way of doing things? How can I imagine an alternative future and begin to imagine ways of doing that? So I think your example of, of these longer durations of occupation, of, of wait times, of being forced to wait, uh, accomplish those two things, get us to hope for different futures, but also identify how structures are inhibiting those. Why are we delayed in infinitely here, it seems like? How do we get past this delay? How do we get past 
um, wait times that may seem to just continue to go on. Uh, and my fellow panelists, that was the, their takeaway about what's happening in South Africa right now. Uh, how do you imagine a different future that's something you can accomplish? Uh, and for them, there was a bit of pessimism there as well, is that it, for many, they're so discouraged with that future never arriving that they've begun to sort of abandon that hope. Uh, that the wait time doesn't signal hope any longer, it signals despair. Uh, so it, it taps into the existential crisis that's also around waiting, is that we often fear wait times are all that life is. Uh, you know, if you think about uh, Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Godot, that's sort of the theme. We wait for the thing that never arrives, and life is about occupying that in-between time. And how do we occupy that, that in-between time? So our disdain for the wait times often signal that existential crisis of what time actually means in our lives, and, and that it might just be waiting is at the core of it. I don't relate the question to that. Um, as I was reading the book, um, uh, one version of this question could also be that some sort of the theory that comes together in the book that you present and develop is strongest where it's it where the waiting is some sort of between messages, right? Yeah. And, and I was wondering as we expand some sort of the, the context of waiting into areas where it's it's less mediated but more other actions yeah. and behaviors that may or may not be facilitated by technology, how far we can go to, to take insights from, you know, the mediated yeah. communication context towards all sorts of acts. Now, of right. course, you can always argue, well, every act is also a communication act right, or a right. speech act. What, what have you, how have you navigated this some sort of spectrum? Yeah, so I begin with messages as a you know, media studies scholar thinking about these wait times between the ways that we connect with each other, with each other and sort of explode it out into everyday life and all of the ways that we're asked to wait uh, and how we can use this, this small everyday moment to understand larger issues uh, in life. And for me, I think that's sort of the larger trajectory and aims of my work is to take something that's mundane and, and let it represent these larger questions. Uh, so the wait times for a text message uh, is, is something that's often not really studied. It's felt, uh, especially if we're forced to wait, if you express yourself in a very intimate way over a text message with someone and you're waiting for their response, you, that's significant. Uh, but you can use these often overlooked moments to identify uh, the ways that these larger issues get embedded into life. Um, there's uh, a cultural geographer, Raymond Crabe, uh, who does Latin American geography. And in an article of his, he had this line that I just use over and over again. Uh, he's talking about the role of maps in our lives. And he says, you know, sometimes the most uh, dangerous and influential things in our lives are the things that are so common sense that they go unquestioned. Uh, and for me, that's where wait times sit. It's that it's so common sense to wait. It's just so mundane. And that is where power resides. And in, in the things that you're not coerced to do, but you accept as common sense. This is just the way things are. These are the ways I am supposed to use my time. Uh, this is common sense. Uh, I'm supposed to wait here. I'm supposed to wait like this. And if you then pull back from the common sense and then begin to critique, so much of life gets uncovered, I think. And, and you do see it everywhere. After you, after you uncover that one moment, then it's hard to not notice in every little aspect of life, from a romantic relationship to waiting at the DMV uh, to looking at the design of computers and how your mobile device loads particular kinds of things, uh, all the way back through historical examples. And you just end up seeing it everywhere. As soon as you take something as mundane as waiting and say it's not as common sense as we're led to believe, there's a lot to unpack within this mundane example that we can use uh, across life and, and think about time and synchronicity and power. Uh, it's certainly my experience, and you should have put a, a warning uh, yeah. early <laughs> on to once you read the book, you will see the wait times everywhere, yes. and you start to think more about these issues. Yeah, for other commentary. 
So you very eloquently described the strong neuropsychological effect of waiting. And the phone essentially gives us a whole menu of waiting mm. points, whether yep. it's email or text right. or news. Picking up on news and my own experience yeah. of being disappointed when I go on and it's the same pieces of news. Right. And the horrible speeding up of the news cycle. Yes. Would you actually link it to this neuropsychological effect on our phones? Yeah, linking, uh, yeah, I think part of it is cultural and the other part is cognitive. Uh, and the cultural aspect is very fascinating though alongside that, that we do have a technology that uh, connects us in such instant ways that we then anticipate that. Uh, so we build that into the uh, cognitive experience of, of wanting news. And yeah, when you refresh it and nothing comes, that to me is why I think we're half in love with the buffering icon, because it represents the promise of something that might be there. Uh, and then when it's not, oh, nope, same, same thing. I was hoping for something new. Uh, but even in my own practices of turning toward instant social media feeds like Twitter for my news instead of the local news channel because it will be there faster. And that expectation of pace has deep ramifications for knowledge exchange. Uh, some are even pushing for pauses in the news cycle, like a, a design that privileges the pause instead of the instant. Um, and I, I was uh, listening to a scholar present on this um, and talk about the the desire to, to value pause within the news cycle and imagine how we could socially look at silences as uh, benefits to this context. And everyone in the room said, no, it's just not gonna happen. We, we're never gonna go there. But it's really fascinating to begin to think, well, what sort of social context would privilege that? It, it's a really good question. If the news cycle privileged pauses and silences instead of speed, what would that look like and what would society look like? How could you build in the desire for that instead of the desire for the instant is a really fundamental question. I think at this juncture in history, we're going to have to ask those kinds of questions. So, yes, yeah. And uh, just uh, as, a, as a quick uh, follow up on, on this um, notion of potential benefits and and understanding it almost as a design challenge, uh, what meaning we, we construct and attach right. uh, to, to waiting. In, in, you mentioned empathy already in the conversation. You mentioned some sort of the knowledge uh, generation opportunity, the imagination opportunity that it may provide. One of the additional components you describe in the book or benefits is, is more uh, around problem solving and yep. that not getting a response immediately yeah. may actually may, may help right. almost as a constraint or yes. drive, I should say, right. uh, problem solving. Yep. Um, you want to maybe add that? Yeah, so that I write about in the context of uh, our communication with uh, deep space and the spacecraft like New Horizons, uh, where delays are built into the knowledge production of this uh, spacecraft that goes out to places we've never been before. And the wait times are built into how knowledge gets produced. But as soon as you launch that thing into space, there are constraints around the communication and how you interact with it. So if you're a scientist and you're doing experiments, there's one thing if you can do that in real time. Okay, we're gonna change this, this part of the experiment and see the results. But when you're dealing with nine hours of lag time between sending and receiving messages to a spacecraft that's three billion miles away, you don't get the opportunity to be like, okay, let's try this thing. So on the 4th of July, right as New Horizons is about to do its closest flyby, it's, it's about 10 days out from doing uh, closest approach to Pluto, they lost connection with it. It stopped responding. They lost telemetry. And so how do you respond to that? So this uh, is what I talk about in the chapter as an enabling constraint for these scientists to imagine these moments where you're going to have to create a contingency list based on the delays, and those delays allow you to build and innovate in new ways uh, that you wouldn't, have, you wouldn't be forced to otherwise. And it's transformed the space, space program in dramatic ways. What it even means to, to measure space and to locate spacecraft are all built around delays 
uh, and using those delays in productive uh, kinds of ways. And in our own lives, I, I think the same is true, where productivity, innovation, is not about the pace at which we can produce things and, and do it at a particular kind of speed. It's often about the pauses that we take. It's about taking the constraint of delay and using it as an enabling feature uh, to try to build in delays in our own processes to, to capitalize on creativity and innovation. We can't innovate without delays. And actually, again, this is a cognitive process too. You can't move things from short-term memory to long-term memory without pause. Um, you know, the, the synthesis of proteins in the brain requires delays in order to move something from short-term memory uh, to working memory to long-term memory. And if you expect to innovate on knowledge, you need to build in the times for that to happen. And a Google search and move on does not accomplish that. If you are going to build knowledge and innovate on it, it requires building in a structure of delay that is an enabling constraint in your own life. And I think the space program uh, is a real great symbol of that because that's sort of the essence of it. These long delays that are built into space exploration have, I think, direct ramifications for our own lives and, and how we innovate on knowledge. Thank you. Maybe one sure, more thanks. question or comment. Um, so I wanted to ask about the boundaries of the category of waiting. Yeah, so great. I'm thinking in part about there used to be an undergraduate course here called loitering. And nice. it was like the goal was to go out and loiter. Great. And this would make you a better person and more creative and thoughtful. And, um, and so how is that different from waiting? Right. How, how do some of the benefits that you describe also apply to idleness or loitering or those yes. kinds of things? But then also, like, what isn't waiting? Like, you know, once the concert starts, you're sort of waiting for it to end, you know? Right. So I'm also mm. curious, like, where, when, do, yeah. when does the waiting end? Or is waiting just, like, are you just defining, like, life and we're just waiting yes. to die? That's a little right, that's, yeah. That's, yes. sort yeah. Of, that's sort of my question yeah. of the boundaries on either yeah. side. Yeah, I think that's a line in the book. We're just waiting to die, actually. You know? um, but um, it, it's a great question. There are um, many different forms that waiting takes, but there are um, experiences of time that sit alongside waiting, like the pauses, like being mindful, um, taking pauses, being silent, uh, loitering, I think, fits within that. And I think one of the differentiating features is our level of agency over those times. Often waiting is so frustrating because we feel powerless in it. Uh, we don't feel like we own our own time. Well, if I'm loitering, I might be loitering because of the ways that someone is asking me to exercise my time in particular ways, or it might be my own agency over my time. I'm not supposed to wait out here, but I'm going to. Uh, and this is my uh, action of, of resisting being commodified in this space. You're asking me to spend money, I'm going to wait. I'm going to not spend money out here. Uh, I'm going to resist that structure. Um, but that ha you have agency over that. Uh, the mindfulness movement that's really arisen within businesses uh, to slow ourselves down, again, has, you have agency over that, uh, ideally. You, know, you, you may be so busy that you can't be mindful, and there becomes that, that tension and that contradiction in your own life over how you get to exercise your time. But for the most part, these are centered around how you decide to exercise your time. In contrast, you have something like waiting rooms at welfare offices in South America that are designed to be uncomfortable spaces with too few seats, with very little feedback, to emphasize your powerlessness within that society. You don't have agency over how your time is being used. You are forced to wait. Um, someone else is controlling your time. So that's where I find a real interesting distinction between waiting and those sort of companion experiences of time that look like waiting. Uh, and I think you can analyze them all together, uh, but I think there's that, that distinction. And I think what is not waiting is often the time that is not noticeable, the time that goes by so fast, the fluid time, how when we feel we're productive, when we feel that we're enjoying things and time flies, waiting in contrast is slow and opaque. We kind of trudge through it, we slog through it, we, we feel it in a very embodied way and in contrast to what might be like productive or fun time that, that just sails by and we rarely notice it while waiting, we're watching the second hand slowly tick by. Uh, so I think those are the contrasts. You have this wonderful line um, and you mentioned it 
during our conversation already, but I want to read it anyway. Um, in the act of waiting, we become who we are. Waiting points to our desires and hopes for the future. In our conversation, it has also become clear that um, this opportunity to envision the future and what we can hope for is unequally distributed. Right. Um, you talked extensively about the power issues. Um, to conclude, what will be your recommendation? What can we do as individuals, mm -hmm. some sort of, yeah. to make this positive view and this positive experience of waiting and its its um, opportunity into the future more equally distributed to Great. all of us? Yeah, for me, the first step is moving past the emotions of waiting, which can be raw and reactive, uh, where we despise it in visceral kinds of ways. And instead, in those moments, I encourage people to ask who benefits from you waiting. Uh, asking about the benefits of waiting, I think, are really interesting. In part, you might benefit from your own waiting. You have a retirement plan. You've decided not to take out that money. You are going to accrue that money, and you are the beneficiary of your wait time. On the other hand, someone might benefit from forcing you to wait, uh, like in the example of the welfare office in South America, the beneficiaries of those people waiting are those in power. Uh, they get to reiterate that power structure. So in my moments of waiting by saying, who is benefiting from the fact that I'm waiting right now? Often if I'm at a red light, it's that person who gets to go. And I am again feeding into the social fabric of life, allowing people to move. But then again, someone in a position of power might benefit from my wait times uh, in ways that where I can identify again, how time is unevenly distributed, how people are put at a disadvantage. And by asking the question, who benefits from people waiting, we can imagine ways to unearth those power structures and, and the social structures that do force us to use our time in uneven uh, kinds of ways. And then finally, I think getting us to think about time as collective instead of individual is fundamental here where instead of you imagining your time as your resource that some people can use well or misuse and rob you of, instead if we imagine that time is collective and we are experiencing time in collective, we, in collective ways, we can invest time in one another and hopefully get to the place where we have a more just use of time and ju more just structures where time can be distributed more evenly to people so then they can use that time to imagine new futures and innovate uh, and, and imagine ways of doing things different that, that might benefit a broader population. Thank you so much for a great conversation right, and for a great you. book. Thank right. you. Thank, thank you so much. Appreciate it.